So we're the junior and senior class of Mount Madonna, and we have questions prepared, but if you have opening remarks, statements, anything, we'd be very happy to hear. Okay. The, the question I always ask, ask myself, and maybe you ask yourself this, is how did I get here? <laughs> you know, um, I remember once uh, I um, bicycled across Siberia. Don't do it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, at one point, uh, they took us on an expedition on a helicopter to, with a, a Japanese climbing team. And, but they took us on this helicopter and they plopped us down on a glacier, you know, and then the helicopter flew away. And you're going, okay, now, now what? <laughs> how did I get here and how am I getting off this glacier? <laughs> Obviously we did it, ultimately. Um, oh, well, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll be interested in your questions around my career, but in terms of sort of seminal kinds of things that have got me on track uh, with, um, with particularly women's leadership, um, was, uh, again, if you've done some research, you'll perhaps know this, but I, I did have a sort of a question. I often call it the in the shower question. You have them? Yeah, the, you, should, you should keep them in the shower. Um, yeah, but um, it, it, at the time, it's about 20 years ago, I guess, uh, at the time it was, what would it be like to have a woman president in the United States? That was the question, right? Um, and it wasn't an arbitrary question because um, I had read some research for the Center for American Women in Politics that indicated that uh, it was the first quantitative study I had read. In other words, a statistically valid study. And if you get your MBA from Harvard, you have to have statistically valid studies, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this was not a qualitative study. This was not just sort of uh, interviewing people. This was a quantitative analysis of women state legislators because there were now enough women state legislators that had been elected to actually do this kind of analysis. And the center found that women state legislators actually legislated differently than men. Um, both Republican and Democrat didn't matter to the party, but that they interacted with their constituents differently, they handled committees differently, um, they brought votes to up differently than the men did. And I thought, God, that's interesting, you know, that there would, that, because that was the first clear differential that I had seen based on gender on a statistical a level. So uh, that's when I got to this thinking, the shower thought question, well, if that were the case for women state legislators, what would happen in the United States if we had a woman president? What would change? You know? um, and as we know, we still don't have the answer to that one uh, yet. Uh, but the, the, at the time as I was doing this, and again, if you've done some research, you'll know that there were 20, uh, 15 women at the time living who were president or prime minister of their country at the time, or had been. And uh, so then I said, okay, maybe I could meet one of these world leaders. Now I gotta tell you, I have no idea why I thought I could meet a world leader. You know, I'm, I, I'm not from CNN. You know, I never really asked anyone what kind of a tree they would be if they were a tree. So my in interview skills are limited. Yeah. Um, but I thought, well, okay, let me ask. And you know, one of the things that I often say in, is to younger people particularly, what would have happened to me if I had not asked for the interviews? What would have, what would have happened? If I don't ask for the interview, what the, what's the answer? No. No. The answer is no, because you haven't asked. Right? So now you ask for the interviews, there are two possible answers, which are? No and yes. No and yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> very good. <laughs> um, and so I asked for the interviews with these world leaders. Now, you know, behind it was an enormous amount of research. I read up on every one of the leaders. I was living in Seattle at the time. I asked a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist to help me think about the questions to ask these leaders. Um, I was picking up camera crews. I had no, no idea anything about that, because I, but I did want to create a documentary of the interviews. I didn't know anything about that, so I had people helping me think through that. A friend who, the business school, who worked at CNN, so he gave me the name of pickup camera crews in each of the countries, because I was paying for this myself. I had no idea what it was going to cost. Anyway, 
So I did, you know, ask for these interviews with the world leaders and, you know, cut to the chase, I guess. 18 months later, I did, in fact, meet all 15 of the world leaders. Yeah, and uh, none of the leaders turned me down for an interview. Not one. Well, to be fair, Margaret Thatcher said, come back after you've met everyone else. <laughs> I'm pretty sure she thought, ah, got to rid of me. You're never going to see me again. You know? um, but uh, I don't know. Are any of you experiential learners? You got to do it. Yeah. 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 You're experiential learner? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in my case, it meant I should have started with small town mayors. <laughs> Worked my way up to presidents and prime ministers, but I didn't. But so I was uh, extremely grateful. I'd actually met 14 other prime ministers before I got to Margaret Thatcher, you know, so she could so I knew what I was doing by the time I got to her. You know, she was a tough one. She was tough. She would talk about, you know, cameras. She was so conscious of her image, so conscious. She was constantly battering the cameramen. You know, she required I bring a makeup person. Uh, someone said for you or for her. It was for her. Um, she was very conscious of her image. But she, um, you know, I was scheduled. Her scheduler had me with her for half an hour. Um, I was with her for over two and a half hours. She displayed a trait that I think all good leaders, whether you agreed with her policies or not, all good leaders show, which was she was enormously curious. Enormously curious. She just wanted to know what every other leader had to say. And, uh, and all my interviews were getting longer and longer because each of the world leaders wanted to know what the others had said in response. So, you know, and the prime minister would complain about some problem she had. And I'd go, oh, prime minister, don't worry. Prime minister so-and-so had the exact same problem. Don't worry. It's like a little therapy after a while. It's like, there you are. Anyway, so... Um, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's one of those things where you go down a path and you don't quite know where it's going to take you. Um, but in this case, you know, because I did hear so many similar stories, I asked them if they wanted to meet each other. They said they did. And so we actually, I collaborated with the Center for Strategic and International Studies here, CSIS, on a summit. And we had a summit in Stockholm. And that's where uh, the council was created. And uh, the leaders... Um, President Vigdis of Iceland became the first pre chair of the council. He asked me to be the secretary general of it and the council. I had no idea that that's what was going to come out of this thing. And uh, the council's been around since then. And so if any of the females in the room are, uh, any of you are freely elected head of state or head of government, we will invite you to join the council. Unfortunately, the men can watch and support <laughs> us. Uh, we, will, we will invite you. We actually... Generally speaking, wait about three months to make sure that the prime minister or president sticks. Because they don't all stick. <laughs> so we wait about three months. So now we have uh, 71 women members of the council. Um, or, you know, we have a few problems. Um, a couple of them have gotten thrown in prison. What do you do with a member who's gotten thrown in prison? <laughs> you know? So we suspend them for a while. <laughs> I mean, it's a real problem, trust me. Because <laughs> as we know, men can be corrupt, corrupt and women can be corrupt. Yeah. And uh, we get caught in that. Anyway, so that's, that's how I've ended up as the, the Secretary General of the Council of Women Leaders. So it, it continues to this day. And, you know, we have summits of the leaders. We have a student fellows program from Columbia where we place students at, uh, both men and women, uh, at the president or prime minister's office. Uh, but just we're working only with Columbia University right now with that. So, all right, that's sort of the basis of the council. I have had certainly other parts of my career uh, that I've done, 16 years, just off of 16 years with a small investment bank, Goldman Sachs. Um, <laughs> uh, so, Eddie. Will, why don't you, uh, why don't you go so ahead start. And, and start questions in? Okie dokie. Okay, you're Will? Yes, indeed. Yeah, if you could all say your first name, I'd appreciate it. As co-founder and secretary general of the Council of Women's Leaders and previously the, di and previously the director of the Women's Leadership Project and the co-founder of the White House Project, mm. you've dedicated yourself to helping women become, uh, becoming and being powerful leaders. 
What are some of the characteristics that you look for and want to support in your women leaders? Well, you know, that, it's a good question. Um, we don't actually s go out and endorse a woman who's running for office. We can't do that, you know, because we just have to be neutral. And once she gets elected, she gets elected from whatever party. But if you say, what are the traits of great leaders? If that's the question you're asking. That's a good question. That's a good question. Okay, we'll take that question on. Um, you know, it's 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 definitely not what it used to be, which is sort of what what we used to call the great man theory of leadership. You know, the single person riding off into the sunset alone, having you know had this great victory or whatever kind of thing. It's a much more collaborative kind of thing. But you know, if you look at traits of leadership, I mean, what are the traits of leadership? We could all go through some of them. You know. Does a person create a sense of trust? Do they have that curiosity? Do they have ideas? Can they express their ideas? Um, do, they, do they energize other people so that other people can reach their goals, right? They have, generally speaking, you're going to have to have a sense of humor about some of this stuff. Do they have that? And they, um, do they have a, a direction? Do they have a point of view? Sometimes, for women particularly, I will often say, all right, what is your point of view? You know. Tell me that, and be able to articulate that. And um, it's interesting, Howard Gardner in his book, uh, Leading Minds, if you haven't read it, it's really interesting, um, said there are four great traits of leaders. The first one is he says that, that great leaders have uh, what's, what he calls a true north, a true north, which means what, incidentally? What does a true north mean? Uh. Well, true north, that's different than magnetic north, but it's basically... <laughs> okay, we got a scientist in the crowd. <laughs> I'm Eagle Scout, I better know these things. Good, <laughs> excellent. Proud of you. But I'm guessing it means it's, it's something that's like your core value that, that leads all your decisions or is yeah. part of all your decisions. Yeah, very good. That's, yeah, so there's a, lot, a real parallel between the, 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 the scientific north and the true north of a person's value system. Yeah. And they don't, they don't move from them. They, change, they may change their mind, but they don't move from their value system. He said the second thing was is that um, they were willing to challenge authority, yeah. and which sometimes is interesting because I think for, for women, it, there's a little more social negative consequence that comes from challenging authority than, than men have. You know, I think men can challenge authority, um, and no one sort of looks at them other than, oh, really? Okay, you can do that. For, for women, challenging authority does have a little bit more of a problematic element to it. Like, whoa, who does that, you think you are? Challenge authority kind of thing. So I, I recognize that, you know, and incidentally, Margaret Thatcher told me life is not fair. So when I do make these gender distinctions, just remember life is not fair, you know, but they, they do exist. They do exist. So women have to challenge authority in a slightly different way than men do. Third, he said that, um, that they literally had the capability to communicate their ideas. And what, what are the ways we communicate our ideas? I mean, how do we communicate our ideas? Well, how do we do that? Uh, well, there's body language, uh, yep. language. Yep. Uh, there's, well, there's, you could write it down and send it, I guess, yeah. in many forms. In many forms, yeah. And you can speak it. Right? So if you think about leaders, you know, how do we often hear leaders? We, we hear them. They, yes, they write, obviously. But speaking, you know, and for any of you who are interested, the number one fear of Americans is public speaking. Number two is snakes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> number five. You know, number five is, what is it? It's... Um, is death. <laughs> so, you know, so you basically, well, you'd rather die than give the eulogy. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, anyway, but the point there is, is that particularly where you are now, you know, as you're growing and developing and learning your skill sets, Take as many opportunities as you can to practice speaking, to practice conveying your ideas, to practice being challenged in your ideas. You know, because to lead also requires you to go from being 
in the crowd to standing in front of the crowd and having your ideas challenged. Yeah. So every opportunity you get, wherever it comes, at school, outside, you know, your church, your whatever, your social group, Eagle Scout, take on the opportunity to practice public speaking, practice conveying your ideas, and get feedback from people. Did I convey my ideas? You know, how did it sound? And et cetera. Um, so that, that's the third thing he said. And the fourth thing he said uh, was that great leaders had traveled. What did he mean? I'm just going to point to people because I like to point to people. What did he mean by traveling? What do you think he meant? Um, gets different perspectives from yeah. all over the place. Yeah, you know, he ultimately didn't mean travel to Zimbabwe. Interesting as that would be, obviously. Yeah. He did mean travel outside of your worldview, yeah. which is enormously difficult to do. Because we all have this worldview, and we think our worldview is the same worldview that everyone else has. When in fact, they could be living entirely different sets of experiences. You know, um, it's an example I might give is, uh, is what I would call the possibility frequency issue. Um, so look at, I'm a white female, and I go out to hail a cab here in Washington, D.C. It's entirely possible, because it's happened to me, that the cab driver goes right past me and doesn't pick me up. It's entirely possible. It's happened to me. Hmm? White female. Okay. I'm a man of African descent. I'm a man of South Asian descent. I'm a man of Hispanic Latina descent. And I go to hail a cab. How often do you think the cab driver goes past him? Anybody give a wild guess? Pretty often is a good answer. They actually did a sting out here. One of the news stations did a sting. White man, black man, five times more. Cab went by him five times more than the white man. So if I said to him, well, we're living in the same world, not even close. Possibility for me, frequency for him. Right? Another example of not living in that same world, of not having travel. I'm a white female. My name is Laura Liswood. I travel a lot, a lot of different countries. So I get randomly searched at the airport. I just was randomly searched at the airport. Okay. My name is Mohammed. How often do you think I get randomly searched at the airport? Ask a Mohammed. <laughs> yeah. So I haven't lived in the same world Mohammed's lived in. You know, and until unless I can travel to Mohammed's world or at least understand what he's going through, how could I possibly you know, be entitled, have the privilege of, one, of being able to lead someone if I don't really have an understanding? I mean, I can't, I'm not Muhammad, so I can't experience that to that extent, but I can certainly be much more aware of the dynamics that he has to go through. You know? And you know, it's, it's, it, it is particularly challenging for dominant group members to understand what non-dominant group members are going through. It's particularly challenging. I call that, uh, I'm on the board of the Smithsonian Zoo, so I have a lot of animal examples. <laughs> so I call that the elephant and the mouse. If you're the elephant in the room, what do you need to know about the mouse? Not much. If you're the mouse in the room, what do you need to know about the elephant? Everything. Everything. So dominant groups don't know much about non-dominant groups, but non-dominant groups know an enormous amount about dominant groups. Yeah. So that's, you know, this traveling thing's tricky. It's a really tricky one. So you have to attach that curiosity of leadership. So I think, you know, those are the traits that I look for. Now, what are the traits that others might look for? That's interesting, you know, because we have some really strong archetypes of what leaders look like. We do. Incidentally, where do we pick up these archetypes of, where, of what leaders look like? Where do you think we pick them up? Media. Media. Yeah, pretty much. The media. The media will teach us who people are, whether we know they're teaching us. You know. So if, if any of you uh, uh, read through any of Gina Davis's work, she's got a media foundation. She's look at it. It's very interesting. She's got a media foundation. She's looking at race roles and she's looking at gender roles. 
in like G-rated movies, like 2000. She's looking at 2000 G-rated movies, looking at race roles, gender roles. She's looking at who's the hero, who's the perpetrator, who's the victim in these movies across the 2000s. So for example, she looked at 2000 G-rated movies. Who, uh, who, was in the, who was in the public sphere? Right? In, you know, who's just out in the public? And if you thought about it, you think, God, it must be about 50% women and 50% men in these crowd scenes. 86% men, 14% women in 2,000 movies. Right? Now, you didn't notice that. I may not notice that. But next time you look at a movie, so you look at the crowd scene and see. But what does that tell you? If 86% of the people in the public sphere are men and only 14% are women, what does it actually tell you? Who's entitled to be in the public sphere and who's in, who should be in the private sphere? That's what it tells you. Right? But you don't know it's telling you that. She also incidentally looked at um, that men had, in twenty movies in 2017, men had three times the speaking roles of women in, in movies. And uh, African-American men had three times the speaking roles of African-American women. So what is that telling you? It's telling you something about who's entitled to speak, you know, who's entitled to lead. Did you guys all like Frozen? Did you watch See Frozen? Did you see Frozen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little small waist on that princess, just a little too small. <laughs> and I don't know if you knew this, but 50, 57% of the lines said in prose were said by men. Even though it's just like this, I know, it's like, oh, how disappointing. I was this princess, and she was a hero. And it turns out over half the lines were said by men. So the media tells us who leaders are. There's a great research by Malcolm Gladwell in this book, Blink. Have any of you read Blink yet? It's a great, it's, it's a great fun read. Um, where he has discovered that 16% of men in the United States are six feet or taller. Okay? Cohort, 16%. Fine, fine. Then they measure the height of Fortune 500 male CEOs. 57% of Fortune 500 male CEOs are six feet or taller. That is four times the cohort. Just go up two inches. 4% of men in the United States are six foot two inches or taller. 30% of Fortune 500 male CEOs are six foot two inches or taller. That is almost eight times the cohort. And I actually have done a lot of research and I've written some books. I've yet to see any research well, that correlates leadership ability and skeletal structure. <laughs> but you're at eight times the cohort. So that tells you statistically that you have an archetype of what a leader looks like. You have an archetype. The military, I used to do some work with the military. Yeah. Great phrase, large and in charge. That's the phrase. Anyway, hopefully, long answer to your good question. Hi, my name is Sienna. Sienna? And in the lattice duck, you said, there's no such thing as a glass ceiling for women. Mm. It's just a thick layer of men. <laughs> yeah, <well. laughs> Besides this thick layer of men, what do you think holds us as women back from breaking through? Well, the, the glass ceiling thing is just a speech line. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good one. It's a good one. It gets a laugh. I'll, I'll agree with you. It is a good one. And I put it in the loudest duck? Really? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you know, look, at the, there's a combination of institutional things, legal things, individual things, individual people that can hold anyone back. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, beliefs about what women have the capacity to do, what men have the capacity to do, and that gets passed on to people. So it's sometimes hard to overcome those kinds of things. Uh, but I don't, I don't argue really strongly that, that that there's something wrong with women, you know. I'm more likely to look at what are the social negative consequences, what are the so societal sort of norms that we may even not be aware of that are causing these kinds of things. You know, whether it's, um, you know, uh, who speaks up in meetings, for example, in the loudest duck, I talk a lot about that. Um, it's who gets interrupted in meetings, you know, who, you know, who has to go through either, you know, tightrope bias or prove it again bias, 
you know, tightrope biases. If you do this, you're too aggressive. If you do this, you're not assertive enough. You know, that's what tightrope bias is, kind of thing. And prove it again biases, you know, you got to show that you're doing it over and over and over again, kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, those are the kinds of things. That, ah, we have a friend um, <laughs> who, um, that, that I think get in the way, you know. And, and it's not that dominant group members are evil, they're not. They've just been in, in positions of power, you know. And I don't know, you tell me, do you know anyone who would willingly give up their power? No. No, <laughs> probably not. So it doesn't surprise me, you know, that people who are in power don't necessarily want to give up their power. Um, you know, uh, I've never, I've worked with a lot of organizations and I've never heard anyone say, well, I got to the top of this organization because I was subtly advantaged. <laughs> who says that? <laughs> they say I got to the top of the organization because it was a meritocracy and only the best get to the top. Little understanding. In fact, no, it's really not a meritocracy. You know, particularly if some groups are getting over scrutinized, that their tolerance for mistakes, you know, is not as great as the tolerance for mistakes for others. And so, you know, I'm just a big one on understanding what the social dynamics are that cause this kind of thing. Yes, do I think that women should practice public speaking, that they should say, yeah, I have a point of view and I, I want to run for office or I want to. I want power to, to, to do important things in life. Yes, I think women should do that, but it's just a lot harder because, you know, again, you know, an assertive man bombs small countries. An assertive woman puts you on hold on the telephone. You'll figure that one out in a minute. <laughs> so th th that's where I go with this when you ask that kind of question. Yeah, it's a good question though. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gracie. Hi, Gracie. What do you get this organized? Like, who speaks and what question? I love it. <laughs> um, in a series of tweets, you said, as a woman, we have to be aware of when we use disarming mechanisms. These can include ritual smiling, ritual modesty, ritual apology, and ritual mitigation. How can we raise awareness of these behaviors to counter the excessive use of disarming mechanisms? Yeah, no, that's good. And did, did you find out the, where the disarming mechanism came from, the concept of it? Did I, I didn't tweet that, okay. <laughs> well, it actually comes from a man named Claude Steele. Claude Steele wrote a book called Whistling Vivaldi. Okay. Now Claude Steele happens to be a large black man. Claude Steele has figured out that when he walks down the street at night behind two women, particularly two white women, he whistles Vivaldi. What do you think the guy's doing? I get it. Yeah, you get it. It's a disarming mechanism, right? right? Because he knows that they potentially have this ugly stereotype about him. You know. And so by whistling Vivaldi, what is he doing? Disarming. He's disarming. He's making them feel comfortable. He's made... So that's where the concept came from. Gotcha. Yeah, disarming mechanism. But then you, then you begin to see where this happens, like the ritual apologies and the ritual humility and the mitigation and modesty. And, you know, I mean, it's, um, first and foremost, it's important to understand when you're doing it, right? So you can choose. Because I think a lot of times, for example, women, they apologize. And as we know, men, women apologize seven times more than men do. Doesn't make men bad people, doesn't make women bad people. It's just a social dynamic. Because apology for women is a, uh, a, is a relational technique, right? If a woman says to another woman, I'm sorry, and the other woman says, oh, I'm sorry too. <laughs> Everybody's happy, right? <laughs> a woman says to a man, I'm sorry, and the man says, you should be. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> like, what just happened? You know, because for for men, generally speaking, these, you know, these are, these, these, this is what cohorts do, not any individual man. So when I say this, men, this is statistically what happens, but you don't necessarily do that as an individual. But anyway, um, so you know, for, for men, apologies are a transactional device which says, I have screwed up. 
hypothetical. When they apologize. For women, I'm sorry is a relational technique. It's a way to just connect with somebody. Right? It doesn't mean, boy, did I screw up, right? Didn't mean, doesn't mean that at all. But if, again, it's like walking in each other's world. If a man hears I'm sorry from a woman, he thinks, well, she must have screwed up about something. Because that's what he would say when he screwed up. You know? So for you, I would say, huh, you know, at least have a, a, what I call a wingman, a you know, wing person, you know, who hears you say I'm sorry and say, oh, hey, you know, just catch on it and decide whether you decide whether you want to say that or not. For a relational technique with women, it's fine. Because you say, I'm sorry to me, I know you didn't screw up. I know that's just a, a, a verbal way that we're going to connect with each other. But, you know, if you're saying it to a man, you might want to pause and say, okay, why am I saying this? You know, what am I trying to do with this? Same with ritual modesty, ritual mitigation. You ever hear any women say, you know, I'm really not the expert on this, but I kind of have an idea, maybe. <laughs> and you're just going, mm, actually, you are the expert on this, you know, and you really do have ideas about this, but you're doing this as a disarming mechanism, right? Because what's the opposite of doing that, do you think? I'm the best around. I'm the best. I'm the expert. I have really good ideas, right? Which is true. But what happens in society if you say that? Oh, she's cocky. She's, yeah. she's, mm. yeah, a little yeah. too aggressive, a little too assertive. She, yeah, she's just kind of pushing it a, a little too much. So you do that. So that's why you do these ritual modesties. But, you know, for people who don't do ritual modesty, ritual litigation, they'll literally hear you say, I'm not the expert on this. And they'll go, well, if you're not the expert on this, why should I actually listen to you? You know, because they're literally taking it as a transactional thing. So you say to yourself, okay, and maybe you have some friends who say, mm, you know, you kind of did one of those ritual modesty things, you know, that you say, well, you know, you, 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 can, you can practice a little bit on that, and you can say, you know, I've done this for 10 years now, I really have an expertise in this, and we need to do A, B, or C, but I really do want to hear what everyone else has to say which actually is a very nice relational technique, which diminishes that social negative consequence that you get by saying that you're the expert on it. So there are ways to get around this kind of stuff. You know, women smile a lot more than men smile. You notice that? When, you know, I mean, I, as a 13 years as a police officer, I stopped smiling. <laughs> you know, or I did it intentionally. You know, I knew when I was doing it, rather than just a reflexive kind of thing because you can undermine your authority by doing that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jordan. Hi, Jordan. Um, my question is, in The Loudest Duck, you speak about the Noah's Ark theory of diversity, mm. where only a token number of each minority group is represented to make the workplace seem more diverse. Mm. Um, what are some of the negative effects of this practice and what can be done to develop real diversity within the workplace? No, my point around the Noah's Ark part of it was that I think a lot of organizations are kind of stuck in that. You know, let's just get two of each of them. Not really understanding, you know, as, as I say in the book, that if the giraffe does look at the zebra and says, geez, you're funny looking. <laughs> yeah. How do you do anything with that stupid short neck of yours? You know, <laughs> if that's what's happening in the workplace, then skip the Noah's Ark. You know, because then you're not actually creating a level playing field for everyone. You know, you're bringing all these people in because you said, oh, yeah, we got to have two of each. You know, but then it's not a level playing field. Then the gir giraffe keeps winning, you know, and the zebra just keeps losing. You know, and you don't hear the zebra and you hear the giraffe. Kind of thing to extend the metaphor too much further, um, but um, so first and foremost, I, I think it's really important that organizations understand that um, this desire that they have, or what they think is a desire for diversity, actually ultimately will, if they don't do something, if they don't have some positive behaviors around the heterogeneity, that the diversity itself will unlevel the playing field. Yeah. That it, embedded in the diversity is the potential 
that you're going to get this disparate behaviors, disparate successes or lack of success, that some people will get overheard and some people will get underheard, right? And some people will get included and some people will get excluded. Yeah, I mean, there's interesting research. I don't think I put it in the book. I can't remember. Um, from uh, Catherine Thomas at Columbia. Um, and she has done her research and has found that homogeneous groups don't come to better solutions. They just think they did. Heterogeneous groups come to better solutions. They just don't think they did. What, what, what do you think, Jordan, is the dynamic around that? Why would a homogeneous group think it came to better solutions but didn't? There's probably more input and different types of input because of the experiences of the individuals. In the homogeneous groups? No, in the heterogeneous, in the heterogeneous groups. groups. Yeah. So what's happening with the homogeneous groups? Well, everybody's probably agreeing with each other because they all think that the same things based on their experiences, more or less. Yeah, exactly. And what is homogeneous thinking called? Well, there's a number of names for it. But yeah, but what's the general name for it? Group think. Group think. Well, that's the name for it. Group think. So that's right. You're right. Everyone, you know, believes the same thing. We're all right. How nice that was. Didn't take very long either, because we're all right. You know. Yeah. How, how nice was that? You know. So tell me about heterogeneous thinking. Well, there are probably people who disagree, and there has to be some compromise in the group because, I mean, if everybody is talking about coming from a different standpoint, then they're not all going to be saying the same things. Yeah, So exactly. Yeah, disagreement will disagreement. eventually create a better solution. Eventually, maybe. Or it just creates conflict, and I don't like you anyway, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't trust you anyway, you know. So it, it has the potential, heterogeneity has the potential to make things worse. If we don't know how to handle the heterogeneity, if we don't know how to deal with it, you know, that's me, sorry. <laughs> you all were very polite and kept your phones away. Um, so that's the problem. So companies say, oh, we must get to this heterogeneity, right? We must have our annual report that looks good. Yeah. And then haven't figured out a way to, to deal with all the differing opinions, all the differing ways people are in the world, whether I, you know, I like you or I don't like you, whether you like me or not like me, whether I've bonded with you or I haven't bonded with you, kind of thing. And so that's where I see the problem, you know, and that's where I think it's really important to, to make organizations far more aware of the diversity alone is necessary but not sufficient. And you really have to develop the inclusion activities and, and really understand that diversity is really about like to like and like to not like, you know. And what happens if, if you're not like me in an organization? And if I, to your point, if I have the power and I'm in the like group, you know, and the people who are in the not like group aren't in power, you know, what do you do about that? Hi, I'm Mara. Hi, Mara. And Michelle Obama recently said, I wish that girls could fail as bad as men do mm. and be okay. Because let me tell you, watching men fail up, it is frustrating. It's frustrating to see a lot of men blow it and win. <laughs> and we hold ourselves to these crazy, crazy standards. So as a mm. woman, have you ever felt pressured to not make mistakes? Oh, of course. I think every one of anyone here who's been from the non-dominant group. <laughs> and I do wanna, do wanna highlight, it's not just gender. It's about dominant groups and non-dominant groups, right? Because men from the non-dominant groups are going to have s some of the same set of experiences mm -hmm. that women would have. And as we know, all women are not monolithic either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, I do want to say that that you know the over scrutiny, and that's what she's talking about, the over scrutiny, you, you know, um, and the standard for perfection is different, right? Yeah. Um, and you know she just she just longs for this the ability to make you know to make more than one mistake you know and then it's like well we tried a woman and she failed I was like after one mistake yeah it's it's, it's really interesting there's um, um there's a theory about women coming into leadership positions uh, presidents prime ministers 
I call it the crumbling cliff theory. I'm sure there's a much more sophisticated <laughs> theory, for, good name for it. But it's basically just when the cliff is about to crumble in a country, they go, oh, well, let's try a woman now. Yeah. Um, because often in the time of crisis in a country, people are willing to go outside of their sort of normal bandwidth and say, oh, well, let's try something different now. And so women often end up running countries that are in the middle of crises. You know, and then they go, well, we tried her and she failed. It's like, well, <laughs> yeah, the country is already failing, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So, uh, you know, I, I think we're all sympathetic. I hope we're all sympathetic to what Michelle Obama is talking about, the over-scrutiny, the tolerance for mistakes, well, not tolerance for, for mistakes. And again, that she's actually articulating the prove-it-again bias. Yeah, kind of thing. And uh, it's frustrating and it needs to be called out. You know, and it's sort of like, well, wait a minute, you know, he failed three times. And incidentally, failure is like the best way to learn, right? Mm -hmm. do, do we, none of us remember the A's. We do remember the, I don't know, any of you get B's? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we do remember the critiques we get from people, right? The criticism, we remember that, you know. And one of the good traits of a, of a leader is that they are willing to take critical feedback, mm -hmm. you know. But what she's saying is, look at, you know, I've got this much bandwidth to fail, and he gets this much bandwidth to fail. And, you know, if you, if you put that on a spectrum, actually, actually and there's some research, so just for example, that white men will have a tendency to have this much bandwidth to fail. Um, white women will have a tendency to have this much bandwidth to fail. Black men will have a tendency to have this much bandwidth to fail, and black women have this much bandwidth to fail. You know, so it's even less bandwidth, you know. Mm -hmm. If you're from a if from another non-dominant group. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, I'm Hi. Noah. Noah. On a related note, you said, I would say that every one of the women leaders that I've interviewed said that the standards by which they thought they were measured was a different standard than by the standard uh, by which men leaders mm. were measured, and the tolerance for mistakes is less. Mm. Can you talk about the different standards and what they can be done, and what can be done to change this? Well, I mean, I think we, we're getting into it already, yeah. Noah, in terms of you know what, how people scrutinize people, and what behaviors would be considered successful behaviors, you know, for a man, for example, in office versus what a woman might be considered successful in, in office. Um, you know, she can maybe make a mistake one time. She can say, "I don't know." one time, but if she says, I don't know twice, they go, <laughs> you know, she clearly doesn't know anything. Men will have a tendency to be able to say, I don't know, but I can find it out. And incidentally, one of the interesting, I think it was LinkedIn that did this, they did a meta-analysis of relationships, connections, and uh, they found that women had um, small but deep connections, relational connections, and men had large but shallow, not shallow in the sense of, you know, what am I thinking, you know, not personality shallow, but less deep relationship than women had. So for a man who says, you know, I just don't know the answer to this, but I know somebody who does, he does, because he has this transactional linkage to all these people, not in a I know everything about you kind of thing, and, you know, you're going to tell me your deepest secrets stuff, which women will have much more relational orientation to that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, I think that, I, I, what do we do about it? I mean, for first and foremost, so for example, it, you know, in the last presidential race or any really uh, current presidential race, I would have liked to have seen uh, at least three women in each party running for office. Because at three, the press stops over scrutinizing the, the, the woman. At one, the press doesn't, and we don't. You know, we, we over-scrutinize that one person, but at three, they stop over-scrutinizing. So, for example, uh, another two self-indulgent billionaire, female billionaires would have been a good idea. <laughs> Had to say that one. Uh, or just, you know, just, you know, a couple of governors. I mean, historically, we have gotten our presidents from the vice presidents, the governors, um, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. That's where we have historically gotten our presidents. His last couple of elections have been real outliers. 
to that you know, kind of thing. So I'd like to have seen a couple of female governors. You know, can't. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, that's an interesting one. So I had done a lot of work in the military. And until the combat exclusion rule was done away with, which was just very recently, no female could be chairman of the Joint Chiefs because you had to have combat experience to be chairman of the Joint Chiefs. So, so you know, that pool was not there for women. You know, governors, not too many female governors, but some. You know, now we seem to be more open to senators and business people and things like that. You know, and so maybe there'll be more. But even senators, we're still knocking the ceiling at 20%. So, you know, so we haven't gotten to critical mass. You know, there was a really interesting research project in Canada. It was five people running for the prime ministership of Canada, and it was three men and two women. Okay. And um, what they did was they just did a, t a tick count of aggressive behaviors in the debate. Right? And the aggressive behaviors were, did they use a sports metaphor? Did they use a war metaphor? Or did they <clears throat> point a finger at you know, the, one of the other debates? So the, and they <clears throat> just stroke counted everybody on those three things. And then, it's a, and then they ranked them. And the first man had a huge number of these behavioral expressions, you know, of assertiveness. Right? Then there was a second man, and then the third man. And then the fourth was the first woman, and the fifth was the second woman. Okay, so they had demonstrably fewer numbers of these behaviors, right, as ranked. Then they asked the audience, who was the most aggressive debater? Hmm? The first woman. And she had like 10 times fewer aggressive behaviors in this stroke count than the men did. So here she was, you know, at one-tenth. And she was considered by the audience to be the most aggressive. Can you imagine why that happens? Can you think of why that happens? Yeah, you can think of why that happens. Yeah, of course you can. Tell us why it happens. You don't expect that kind of behavior from women. Yeah, and so it's really noticeable. So every time she does it, People noticed it. Every time the man did it, it was just part of his personality. So it wasn't noticeable in that regard. So, you know, so from to my perspective, one, we need critical mass of women in whatever entity it is. And two, we need women to do some of these assertive behaviors. So people start normalizing for women like they normalize for men on these behaviors. You know, and you know, to develop somewhat of a tough skin. So somebody says, boy, you're too aggressive. You know, the immediate response is, you mean I'm too aggressive for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's next? Hi, I'm Hi. Imogen. Imogen? Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for women who wish to be in a role of leadership within the current social and political climate? Yes. <laughs> Just step up for whatever it is that you want, whatever leadership role that you want, whether it's sports or whether it's your, in your own school, whether it's community, wh whatever, whether it's potentially running for office at some point, just do it. Just do it. Get a group of men and women supporters behind you, people who can help you reinforce what you want to do and are very supportive of what you're doing. It's the only way you're going to be able to take on leadership roles. Nobody's going to come and knight you a leader. You, know, you have to basically take it. And the reason you want to take on leadership roles now is so you can practice, you know, so you can practice getting people who are snarky, you know, on how to handle the snarky people. You know, I remember the prime minister of Poland, if you haven't seen my documentary, there's a great woman. She, um, she said, if the first couple of months somebody would say to her, you're stupid, as a prime minister, right? And so finally she figured out that, she said, after about three months, so she goes, she said, I stopped listening and I just said, you're more stupid than me. <laughs> so she just figured out how to handle it. Yeah. So that's what you need to do is just, you know, take on the hard knocks, you know, and, and life isn't fair and you will be over scrutinized. So, you know, get your, get your, you know, your practiced lines in when somebody says something to you. You know, I, when I, you know, sometimes as a police officer, you know, somebody will say, would say something to me and I'll say, God, is that really the best you've got? It stops them in their track. 
it's you just you know so for me it's a, it's a I'm very straightforward about this just get out there and do it and you know and don't pathologize if things start to happen to you that's the thing that you know I really sometimes think that women will have a tendency to do which is take in pathologize if someone says you're this that and the other you go oh god maybe I am well no maybe you're not you know kind of thing but we will have a tendency to go oh what's wrong with me you know and lots of research that shows you know when when men fail they often will reflect upon well that was the external environment that caused me to fail when women fail it's like oh what was wrong with me why did I do that you know great research that men have a tendency great trait men great trait called uh, positive illusion <laughs> fabulous trait fabulous trait <laughs> yeah <laughs> what does it mean it means they will hear the positive about themselves and take it in yeah <laughs> so you could say something you know you're not doing very well here at school you know yeah but you know the last project you worked on you were brilliant but you're not doing very well he comes out like going to god i'm brilliant i'm brilliant <laughs> 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 but women have negative illusion they have negative illusion they will take the negative in you know so you could say you know you're doing very well here at school now the last project you worked on you just weren't quite prepared but overall you're doing well you might go oh my god i'm not prepared and i'm going to fail and you know so being aware that these dynamics actually occur that it's not has nothing to do with you they're just dynamics that occur yeah. How and many, then how many of you can identify with that just out of curiosity? <laughs> oh gee. Just checking the room. <laughs> yeah, you can identify with that. Good. Yeah. You're brilliant. I know you're identified. <laughs> no, and look, not all men do that. There are men who have that negative illusion stuff too. But generally speaking, the cohorts will behave in certain ways. Yeah. It's fun. So well, once you know that this stuff's happening, it's like, okay. I can laugh about it. I can go, oh, yeah, that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. <laughs> and it's not like, I, often I will, I have a couple, particularly my police partner, Tom, uh, and I were partners for 14 years, police officers. And I would often ask Tom, Tom, how would you handle this? You know, I'd just ask him, how, you know, how would you handle this? And he'd say something to me, and I'd go, God, that's what you would do? <laughs> <laughs> But at least it gave me a greater bandwidth to think about because I was going to handle it this way and Tom's way the heck over here handling it another way. You know? Now, I wouldn't always agree with Tom as to what he was doing, but at least it gave me a sense of what the possibilities were with something. You know? I mean, for example, in a police department, you, you, know, you confront someone and they may disrespect you. Right? Sometimes you know, you're interacting with a police officer and the person disrespects you. Tom would not let it happen. The minute it happened, he'd put a stop to it. A minute. Yeah. Me, I'd let it go around. I'd let him disrespect me once. Now, if they disrespect me twice, that was a different issue. Right? But sometimes Tom was right to not let it happen at all. And sometimes I was right. You know? But at least I got a sense for you know, how he did it versus how I did it. So it's always good to have someone of the, of not like you to say, you know, to ask, you know, how did that go across? What did you think about that? How did I handle that? You know, just to get their sense of visual. Hi, I'm Ruby. Hi, Ruby. Um, in our interview with Lise Nelson yesterday, yeah. uh, she talked about how men and women lead in different but effective ways. Mm -hmm. She also talked about how we need both men and women leaders to have a flourishing community. Mm. What do you think are the different qualities that women and men bring to the table when it comes to leadership? Yeah, well, what did Lise say? <laughs> I think she didn't address the quality. She was, she as was, much I think, more the in the abstract the of, of, of naming so it. Really so we thought we'd follow up and put the pressure on you. Oh, thanks. Okay. Yeah, really nice. Well, I mean, you know, there are there are some theories around that that women will have a tendency, to perhaps, be more collaborative, and men will have a tendency. And you have to say tendency because not everyone does whatever. You know. Um, and that men will have a tendency to be a little more command and control approach to things and that women will have a tendency to bring more people into the decision making and stuff like that, um, more relational. Um, you know, again, I, I will say that, number one, I like Margaret Thatcher, she was definitely, you know, not a collaborative person. You know. 
she was very much, she, you know, because she, she was the only O in a room full of X's, mm -hmm. right? If you're the only O in a room full of X's, chances are you're going to have to try to turn yourself into an X. Yeah. And that's what she did, basically. She uh, took on the uh, coloration of the species she was trying to invade. You'll figure that out in a minute. Yeah. So she was very command and control oriented. Right? So it's not specific that women are born with these things. They, 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 because of societal sort of pushes and pulls, women end up you know, having a tendency to be more collaborative, to bring, be more inclusive, et cetera, to, to think about you know, perhaps other constituents. Than, than. But I'm really a big believer that the best leaders take on the traits of the dominant group and the traits of the non-dominant group. So sometimes it's important for us to be collaborative, but sometimes it's important for us to be command and control. You know, yeah, it's like, let's think, uh, you know, if, if this building is burning, you really don't want to have a discussion. You know, I'd like to talk about going through door A, but I really want to hear what you have to say about door B. And we can think about door C, but let's talk about it. You don't want that. You want someone to come in and say, go out, door B, now. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So you need to have both sets of skills. That's what I think. And the best leaders use their skills situationally. They identify what the, what, what's the dynamic going on and what skill sets do I need. You know? So what, do I have the greatest number of tools in my toolbox to pick up? So there are times when I should be collaborative. And there are times when I should, should just be, you know, direct and command oriented. So that, that's my theory. You know, the, there is some research that, um, that women in meetings, for example, are far more, far more, likely, far more likely to be turn takers. Turn, taking their turn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that they're more likely to have a sort of a, the capacity to read an audience. Or, you know, we sometimes call that emotional intelligence, but, you know. But... <laughs> it, you know, it's never as, as simple as you sort of think because if you remember that elephant and mouse analogy that I have, okay, so the mouse is really quite hyper vigilant, right? You got to be, you got to be able to eat and know what the elephant's doing, you know, at the same time. You got to know if the trunk is, you know, is swishing, it means it's moving backwards, right? So you got to know that. The elephant doesn't have to know if the rat's tail is moving, you know, it doesn't concern him. But so, that actually turns out to be a hypervigilance, okay, right? So when you think about emotional intelligence or um, female intuition, a term I'm sure you've heard, yeah, that's actually just hypervigilance of the non-dominant group. I'll pause <laughs> so you can think about that one. Hypervigilance. So emotional intelligence means that I'm hypervigilant to what's going on with other people. I'm noticing their expressions. I'm noticing their body language. I'm noticing, you know, whether they're confused. I, I'm noticing those things, mainly because I've developed that because I'm a member of the non-dominant group who's had to develop that. Right? Now, it's a good trait. It's an excellent trait to have that kind of emotional intelligence. But it's also a pretty good trait to be the elephant, go where you want to go, not worried about what anybody else has to say about anything. So my, my belief and my observation of best leaders is they have both sets of skills. Thank you. Sure. Hi, I'm Summit. Summit. <laughs> um, <laughs> in an interview about your book, you said, Grandma teaches American men that it is okay to brag, to trumpet their success, success at work. For them, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Grandma teaches world or, women around the world that there is a social penalty for doing that. Grandma teaches the Chinese to be modest. They are taught from early on that the loudest duck gets, sh duck gets shot. How can we give everyone equal opportunities despite the fact that there are inherent cultural directives given men and women? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very legitimate question to, to, to ask. Because you remember Noah's Ark? Yeah. Yeah, people bring people in to Noah's Ark not realizing that some people have been taught the squeaky wheel gets grease, some people have been taught the loudest duck gets shot. Right, and the Japanese in the cellar are taught the nail that sticks out gets hit on the head. 
which doesn't sound very much like the squeaky wheel, you know, right? And women are taught, you can't say anything nice. Don't say anything at all. Right? So we don't teach people, so like managers, that when you bring that Noah's Ark in, you're going to have these cultural differentials. And what's going to happen is, is the wheel who grandma has taught, yeah, speak up, speak up, speak up, you know, that we're going to overhear that wheel. And that the loudest duck is not going to talk because grandma taught them, don't be humble, don't toot your own horn, blah, 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 right? And so we're not going to hear. So, I mean, you think about yourself. Let's just say you're a manager in an organization, okay? And you have a team of diverse people because you said you wanted diversity. So now you got it, all right? So now you got a wheel, you got a duck, you got a nail, you got a nice. So incidentally, who's doing most of the talking? Who? The wheel. the wheel. Right. So you're overhearing the wheel and you're underhearing the nail duck nice. And, you know, if you say, what is the true purpose of diversity? What is the true purpose of diversity? It's cognitive diversity, different ways people think about things. So you didn't even get the ideas of the nail duck nice because they're not speaking up. So I want you to tell me what you would do. You're in that meeting and you're running it. And you're over here in the wheel and you're under here in the nail duck nice. What would you do? Probably ask for the... Yeah, well, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But you'd be amazed how many managers don't do that. You would be amazed. They just listen to the wheel, listen to the wheel, listen to the wheel. And then they don't do what I say is act like a traffic cop. You know? Let's hear from you today. Let's hear from you today. Hold on, wheel. That's what traffic cop does. You know, let's hear from you today. Hold on, wheel. You know, because if you don't do that, then you just keep hearing the wheel's ideas, and you don't hear the nail duck nice ideas. You don't get the diversity you said you wanted. Go back to homogeneity. It's so much easier. You know, just have a group of wheels. You know, but you can't. But the point is, is that you came up with a, a tool. I'm going to call on these people. And I'm just adding, you know, do a little traffic cop with it, you know. And some people have been taught by grandma, particularly Asian cultures, don't speak unless invited to speak. Okay, so now you know that. You know, you're running this organization, you know that. So now you're going to say, Noah, what do you think about this? Now I've invited Noah to speak. You know? Some people have been taught by grandma, do not speak unless it comes out perfectly. Mm -hmm. Asian cultures will often have that. So now I'm going to say, Noah, I'm going to call on you in this meeting tomorrow. Noah thinks, he prepares, he speaks. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, just other little, these are the kinds of things that, in my mind, have, that we're not doing, but we should be doing. You know? Did you know that the first person who speaks in a meeting sets the agenda of the meeting? You knew that? No. Okay, now I've told you that. Yeah. First person that speaks in a meeting. <laughs> yeah. And that research actually comes from jury research. When a jury is first sequestered, the first person who speaks, doesn't matter what they say, where are the toilets? When are the sandwiches coming? Doesn't matter what they say. First person who speaks, overwhelmingly voted jury foreman. Overwhelmingly. So my point to you is, you got this wheel, nail, duck, nice. The first person who's likely to speak, unless you do something about it, is the wheel. Every time. Unless you do something. Let's hear from the nail today. Hold on, wheel. Yeah. You see, we don't give people those kinds of tools. I see that, I, you know, I saw that in my business school classroom. Who speaks, who doesn't speak, who's got their hand up, who speaks for 30 seconds, who speaks for three minutes, who interrupts whom, you, you know. I mean, Harvard did it, business school did a real big study on that because they discovered that the women were not being, becoming Baker scholars at the percentages that they were coming into the class. And lo and behold, they found that they were not being called on by the professors in the same way that the men were being called on by the professors. The men were talking longer than the women were talking. The, the teachers, the professors, both male and female, incidentally, were writing the male's comments on the board far more frequently than they were writing the female's comments on the board. Male and female professors. And the pro female professors were just appalled that this dynamic was going on. You know. So they put independent evaluators into each classroom 
so that they could give the feedback to the professors as to what was happening in the dynamic in the classroom. Because, and then that ultimately has led to the women being Baker scholars at the same percentage as the men. Yeah. But these are dynamics that go on, unless you're aware of them. You're welcome. There's two things I've noticed in this conversation so far. Yes. Um, one is that you seem to have an ability to name things. Mm. You, you, you develop language and phrases that, that convey whole mm. concepts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other is it seems that you have a very healthy irreverence for the way things are and the ability to look at things differently. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, that feels to me like something that grew up with you. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering if there were some influences there that caused you to have this sense mm -hmm. of seeing it for yourself and calling it like it is. No, thanks for it. Um, Yes, I, th I suspect that that's true of me, which has gotten me into trouble, as you can well imagine, <laughs> um, at times. The ability to articulate things so that people can hear it, you know. Um, this obviously is not my first rodeo. You know. uh, I have spoken to how many? Thousands and thousands of people and hundreds and hundreds of groups. I actually test out my lines. <laughs> So everything you heard today, actually, you know, number one, everything you heard today was based on research because I do a lot of research. But then it's how do you then ar articulate the research in a way that people can make it actionable, you know, that they can understand it and they, and they, they can take it. So I, I work quite hard at that. You know, the, it looks easy. It's quite hard to do. Um, and I practice it a lot, you know, and sometimes my lines don't work very well and sometimes they work perfectly fine, you know. Uh, I also listen to other people and hear how they say things. Or I listen to people, because sometimes people will come up to me and say, and say, well, you said this. And I'm going, where did you hear me say that? Because you know, they're selectively listening. You know. So then I go, OK, that means I've got to say something slightly differently. So you know, that's, I mean, that's what I do for a living yeah. to a certain extent. So that's, there's that. You know, the lack of deference for how it is. Um, you know, I'm not sure where that exactly came from, but, you know, it certainly has helped that I have a very strong educational background. You know, I mean, I just, truth of the matter is, <laughs> um, when I went to law school, you know, and I went to law school because I was interested in politics, so everybody in, in politics was, goes to law school never realizing you go in as chuck steak and come out as hamburger meat, you know, <laughs> <in> law school, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, the, but the law is a, was, a, it was a fundamentally good place to get the confidence of yourself, you know, to do that and to speak, which is, you have to do that. Um, but, you know, the, this is going to sound, you know, quite flippant, but when I was reading the Wall Street Journal in law school, I realized I could only understand half of the Wall Street Journal. I didn't understand the business side of things. I mean, I you know, grew up in the political science world, didn't have any business experience. My father was a police officer, interestingly. You know, my mother was a housewife and you know, worked hard at home. Um, so that's when I decided I would go to business school. You know, really, I was, it was one of those things. And then I decided, because I'm paying for this all myself, you know, student loans, God knows how you all are doing it now. Um, and but I, I was living in California, and I thought, you know, I just don't want to go to Stanford. I want to get to outside California. And so I applied to one business school and said, if I don't get into that business school, I'm not going to business school, you know. And I did, you know, well-known Eastern business school, as you know. Um, we're P.S. I never met so many men who had the divine right to rule. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, it did, didn't help that, you know, George W. Bush was the class right before mine. Yeah, you know, at business school. Yeah, but you know, you do you do learn, and and that education does sort of stamp you with a grade A on your, you know, and so that gives you a confidence, I think, that you can't be intimidated by people anymore. You know, and so for me, education turned out to be the path that really helped me to do that. And then out of business school, I went into operations in in business to run things. I really wanted to run things. Because once you run things, then people have to listen to you, you know. And you get on the police force, and you get stripes on your sh shoulder, 
people got to listen to you, whether they want to or not. You know, so you, then, then you just develop that, you know, and, but it can get you into trouble. Yes. Mm, thank you. Let's mm -hmm. take a couple comments from you guys about what you've heard that Landis Yeah, and I know we didn't get through all the questions, and I apologize. But. I really liked what you said about how the best leaders combine skills used in the dominant groups and non-dominant groups, because yep. that's something I frankly hadn't heard before, but I think it's okay. really helpful. Good. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things I observed about the leaders was there were conscious leaders and there were instinctual leaders, okay? Now, instinctual leaders are good until they get outside of their experience. Because you, you have instinct because you've had a set of experiences, right? That then mold your instinct. Okay, but then when those experiences change, then your instinct doesn't work very well anymore. The conscious leaders were the ones who actually understood the dynamic of leadership, understood sort of constituent reaction to things or people's reactions to things, and used the different skill sets when they needed to. I mean, classic on that would probably be someone like Lyndon Johnson, yeah. right? Very successful domestic president. Gets into the international sphere, knows nothing, and gets himself into, as we know, unfortunately, tragically, big trouble. Yeah. So to me, the conscious leader is the interesting leader. Yeah. Um, I really liked what you said about um, the differences between men and women apologizing and saying <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> like I think uh, like any of my friends in here can tell you that I apologize a lot, and I guess um, I did really identify more with this thing as a way of connecting yeah. rather than. Right. Um, you and you know. didn't guess probably. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I, I just thought that was really, really interesting. Good, um, good. And I did appreciate um, what you said about um, possibility versus frequency and yeah. dom dominant versus non-dominant groups, because um, we have been talking a lot about women's issues in um, our interviews, and I think that it was nice to see somebody make the distinction, uh, the, the distinction um, between like, you know, men, men of color, women, mm -hmm. women of color, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, probably queer women if we got into it, too. Like, sure, sure, yeah. Really well, again, it's because, you know, even though a, a white male may look like he's in the dominant group, he may not be, you know. Some of these dynamics may be happening to him, too. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so that's what's important, is that so everyone can recognize that, hey, these dynamics are happening, you know. I really liked what you said about finding a balance between being collaborative and commanding, um, and that's like a really good way to lead is having elements of both. And practice those elements, you know, practice that and get feedback from people and realize that you, be, whenever you get out of your archetype, you know, what people expect of you, you know, whenever you cross over to the other archetype, you know, you're going to get cognitive dissonance. You're going to get blowback. Right? So just to understand that that's what's going to happen. But it's really important to get outside of your archetype, for both men and women, to get outside of their archetypes of what people expect of you. But you will get some blowback, you know. And then you just got to learn things like, geez, really? Is that the only thing you can say? <laughs> I liked what you said about diversity and how uh, if you're not aware of how you can sometimes make an uneven playing field, it doesn't really matter what the diversity is if you're just giving advantages to other people. You have to be able to be aware of that and then level the playing field for yeah. everybody. Right, for everybody. Yeah. yeah. So it's a two-step thing. Very good. It, it is a two-step thing because you just get Noah's Ark. You know, you, you're going to have the giraffe and the zebra having trouble. Um, I loved how you emphasized practicing just talking and speaking and using your voice because I think these days it's really crucial that we use our voices for... Yeah. 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 yeah no, it's definitely crucial for, on all the social issues. Yeah. That, I mean, because if you all don't get heard with collective voice, as you know, a lot of stuff's not going to change. Yeah. Right. And you, you are really the ones. So I'm somewhat heartened by some of the collective action I'm seeing, although, you know, don't get discouraged. You know, well, not only don't get discouraged, run for office. I really liked what you said about how the best leaders use their skills situationally. Okay. And how they use their tools to help in different scenarios. Good. That really struck me. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, and then observe different people who lead that you admire and say, okay, what are they doing that, you know, that perhaps I can learn to do? 
you know, with this. And you have role models. That's what role models are for. You know, it's for you to look at people you admire and look at people you don't admire and say, why don't I admire that person? You know, what are they doing that I'm reacting negatively to? You know, that's important too. Thank you so much You're for welcome. taking this time with us. Well, thank you all. You've been very well prepared. You've been extraordinarily nice to me. So, you know, we, at this point, we need you guys to make the changes that are going to happen in the world. And change goes from the unthinkable to the impossible to the inevitable. But somebody has got to say, somebody's got to think outside the box. And it's not unthinkable anymore. And then somebody's got to say, well, it's not impossible. And once you get to that point, then it will become inevitable. So I'm looking to you all to make those kind of changes. In this well, world. thank you for leading thank the you. way. All right, very good.